YouTubers, this is Kevin for The Bad Productions, and we just had another awesome episode of House of the Dragon. This is episode five of season two. A lot of really good stuff happened in this episode. A lot of diplomacy, really a lot of conversations with other houses, trying to lobby for really fighting for Rhaenyra more than the other house, the Targaryen Greens. Instead, the Targaryen Greens plotline in King's Landing was all about two major things. Number one was all about basically the death of Maelise and the death of dragons and the outcome of the battle at Rook's Rest, which means Aegon II is returning to King's Landing, but in pretty crispy conditions. And that means there needs to be a new ruler that's the regent. So huge implications, obviously, after episode four. But we'll get into what those are in a second. First, I want to say, remember, this is a spoiler warning for everything that happens up to and including episode five of House of the Dragon. So if you have not seen episode five or anything up to it and you do not want to get spoiled, please do not watch this video. Also, I want to take a moment and give a plug to this channel. Please, we are on the quest of 50,000 subscribers. We are getting very, very close. So if you give a nice little subscribe to this channel, I would greatly appreciate it. You're helping a little Aemond One-Eyed Targaryen's dream come true. All right, getting into the episode, it starts off with the returning conquering heroes coming back to King's Landing from Rook's Rest. And not only is Sir Kristen Cole and his band coming back, just victors in general, they're coming back parading the head of Maelise the dragon. This is the feared dragon that they, the members of King's Landing have heard about for ages. The, the citizens look at Maelise and go like, wow, how could we ever take down Maelise? This is a Maelise that was in the dragon pit and could have wiped out the entire Targaryen greens and a lot of us. And here it is. This is the head of the dragon, the mythical creature that we were told made the Targaryen special. But it's here, it's just dead. It's just a sack of meat. So this is weird. And at best, as Ryan Condal said, at best, it is a bad omen. At worst, it's basically saying that the Targaryens are not that special. Dragons are not that special. Dragons can be beaten thanks to this parade that Sir Kristen Cole has put on. And once again, for all of you Targaryen green fans out there, listen, I'm dressed as Aemon, but I'm Targaryen black. Once again, this is a reminder the Targaryen greens are awful. They're terrible. They're a waste of space. They may always make the wrong decision except for Otto Hightower, and they cast him out, which is a wrong decision. So this right here is another example of how the Targaryen dynasty is going to go down the tubes thanks to the Dance of the Dragons. And this could be in an unconventional way. This may not be dragon versus dragon. This may be human versus dragon if they're not careful. I mean, even one of the peasants said to Hugh Hammer, said, I thought dragons was gods. Well, he really said it like this. I thought dragons was gods. They was gods, dude. They was gods. But thanks to Sir Kristen Cole, everyone doesn't think that anymore. Now, aside from the dragon head coming back from King's Landing extra crispy, Aegon II came back in a box and, you know, the maesters were trying to rush to get him together. They pulled his armor off, his Valyrian steel armor, which obviously did not melt because it's Valyrian steel. However, it was fused to his skin. So they just layer by layer pulled it off and it was really gross and it was like descaling a fish one by one. It was really, it, it was actually pretty gross. I did not like it. I thought it was a little indulgent. When they popped his like broken bone, I was like, I, I did not like that. But Alison Hightower watched this all unfold, watched her baby boy be taken care of in a way that she never could as a mother because she sucks. However, she did notice Eamon One Eye sitting there with the famous dagger that is passed down from king to heir. And this is the cat's paw dagger that we've seen, you know, originally Game of Thrones, and it was Viserys Targaryen's, and it was given to Aegon II. And now, this is what Aemon picked up at the end of episode four, and is now on his waist. So, Allison saw the dagger there and wondered, with Aegon in that condition, how is it possible that happened? And it seems she put two and two together that Aemon is responsible for this. And that becomes super relevant because the next Green Council meeting with Aegon II bedridden, unconscious, maybe not being able to come back ever again, they need to figure out who's gonna rule in his stead. So Alicent puts her name forward as the person that should rule because she's done it before. When Viserys was bedridden and not doing anything, she was like, hey, I, I ruled things, so it should probably be me. Now, she's also leaving out the fact that Otto Hightower is around as well, but that's not an important detail, I suppose. The rest of her council does not agree with her. Aemon doesn't say anything, but Laris is against her, Archmaester is actually the only one who's kind of for her, but everyone else, it's a no, including Sir Kristen Cole, the hand. Sir Kristen Cole, it's funny, he decides when he should follow duty whenever it conveniences him. 
He says he's sparing Alicent from the horrors of the war that's coming up. However, I really think Kristen Cole is a coward, and he just falls in line. And Eamon didn't really have to worry about anything because he knows he's the male heir. And if there's anything that the Targaryen Greens stand for is having a penis as a ruler. Like, that's the number one thing. If you're going to take away anything from the Dance of the Dragons, the Greens are not putting a woman forward. And Laris the Clubfoot very astutely said that, and he's the guy that stares at Allison's feet. Like, it's funny to sit back and think about that. There's two men on the Green Council that use Allison for sexual favors, and neither of them supported her when it came to giving her power. So think about that when you're talking about exchange of sexual favors for any kind of actual support outside of the bedroom. I do give Eamon a little bit of credit, because immediately he checks in, he's, he says, let's work on the Riverlands, and then number one thing, he says, let's cut the rat catchers down, because the rat catchers are still hanging from the walls of King's Landing for some reason. So that was smart to get him out, but he also orders for that the gates of King's Landing be shut because people are leaving. They're really reeling from the blockade from the Sea Snake. Corlys Valarian's blockade is making sure that everyone is getting starved out in King's Landing, essentially. They're the number one navy in Westeros, so there's really nothing that the Targaryen Greens can do except if they send Vagar to burn all the ships. And that's about it. Otherwise, there's really not much that can really go down. So the peasants are getting really sad about that, and they want to leave. And when they do, they talk about how terrible it is in King's Landing. And everyone says, hey, Viserys, we were so much better under Viserys. So the greens suck. Maybe we should go to Rhaenyra. So Aemon orders the gates to be shut so no one can leave and talk. And I like, I kind of understand where he's coming from, but that's also like a terrible move because then you're just keeping unrest in the city. Like people are just going to keep getting upset and it can't be dispersed. So, like, that's a move that I think shows some wisdom, but it's also at the same time extremely brash and very short-sighted by good old Aemon One-Eye. But shooting up to the Targaryen Black Council, Rhaenyra's having a hard time really controlling her council. No one's really believing in her, especially with Rhaenys and Maelys dying, and Coolis Valarian is really, really sad that Rhaenys has just died. So he's off a drift mark, he's sad, and it looks like he's honestly just kind of getting drunk at this time. So Rhaenyra doesn't really have anyone to support her with Daemon in the Riverlands as well. So she appears weak, her council thinks she's weak, and she's not really doing anything. Right away, her first instinct was to get on a dragon, Syrax, from the beginning and go to war. But everyone, including her council, has told her, you cannot do that. You're the one we're all fighting for. So she's just sitting there twiddling her thumbs, unable to help the war effort, while she's losing allies, she's losing castles, and the war's being turned over to the dragons, and she's one of the few dragon riders they have, and she's probably the best one they have other than Damon, and she can't do anything about it. Although, I'm not going to let her off the hook from a diplomatic standpoint. She has the Starks who have pledged her men, and she has the Vale that has pledged her men. However, the Vale's not going to send any until they get the protection they want. And it looks like they half ass sent protection. Like, the Knights of the Vale are an incredible army to get. Like, there should be no messing around with this. They don't have a land army at this point. So Kristen Cole has taken castles at will, while Damon hopefully raises an army, which we'll get into that in a hot second. But they don't have anyone on the ground to fight. I mean, they're worried about dragons by the end of the episode, but you need footmen. Now, there are two avenues in the episode that really try very hard to get Rhaenyra those footmen. The first one being her son, Jacaris. Jacaris said, I need to be a man of action. I need to go do something. I need to go to the twins because the Targaryen Greens are going to want the twins for a crossing. And instead, we should get it. So I'm going to see if I can make that happen. And he does. He travels to the twins and he meets with Lord Frey and his wife. And they talk about terms. And one of the important things that they want, apparently, is in order to get the free passage from the twins, the Freys want Harrenhal. Which is, it's amazing. I love that in between Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon, everyone wants Harrenhal, but it's easily the most cursed castle in the entire Seven Kingdoms. It's super fascinating how that goes. But Jacaris had a moment of being really, really cool where he said, all right, the queen will want more than just the crossing. She's going to want some bent knees. And they kind of look at each other like, ooh, he means business. And this is like the first real time you look at Jacaris, other than when he was a little spicy with his mother about an episode or two ago, where you said, Jacaris, you're shaping into a nice young lad of a ruler. I'm liking where this is going with Jacaris. He's looking like he's going to be pretty formidable. He even has a really cool moment at the end of the episode that I'll talk a little bit about later. And the other person that is trying to raise an army for Rhaenyra is Damon. He's been trying to do it ever since episode one. He's still at Harrenhal. He's still sucking on that weirwood juice or whatever it is that Alice Rivers is giving him. He's having visions. The grossest vision probably was him having sex with his mother 
Alyssa Targaryen. At least that's what I got from it. And saying like, oh, if you were the, only the oldest son, you're better than Viserys. You should have this, blah, 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 blah. I thought that was really weird. And Alice Rivers knew all about it, which is no surprise because she's the spooky witch lady. I mean, she's really inducing all of these weird visions for Damon. So it's not a surprise. But I will say I'm getting a little bit tired of these goofy flashbacks i would like to see progress made like on the actual ground that would be pretty cool now damon did get some things done first thing opens up he's on caraxes he's meeting with the brackens and said listen i'm gonna burn you all down if you don't join the effort and get over it the brackens are like dude i'm not going with the blackwoods we're not gonna be on the same side i don't care what you say and instead of burning them which damon threatened them with he let them go and he talked to the Blackwoods and said, maybe you should persuade them some way. Which later on, we find out from Alice Rivers that the way it was, was by like a bunch of babies being taken from the Brackens and essentially doing a bunch of shifty stuff in the middle of the night. Not true warfare. And that is what Damon suggested to the Blackwoods. Even though the Blackwoods didn't seem totally on board with it, they did it. And word came out from Sir Simon Strong that the Brackens had bent the knee to Damon Targaryen and are going to support Rhaenyra and fight with the Blackwoods. Which you think, ta-da, you know, huge, huge deal. You basically solved one of the longest conflicts that's been repeated in the history of Westeros. Like, way to go, good job, Damon. But we find out later in the episode, it was actually the worst thing that could have happened. All the other Riverlords found out about what happened to the Brackens after that. The Blackwoods ended up doing all these things. They took the babies, they took their, their, their wives, they started doing really nasty things, they started taking all their cattle, all their land, everything. And the Brackens were basically bled dry in the most cruel of ways. And it looks like Rhaenyra is the one that was okay with it. And the fact that Daemon is the one that is credited with murdering Jehera Targaryen in King's Landing, and this happens, on his word, is not a good look for him, and obviously not for Rhaenyra. So essentially what happens is the River Lords say, we will not fight for Daemon Targaryen, and that means no Rhaenyra. So instead of gaining the power in the Riverlands, he's losing the power of the Riverlands. And it created this really fun parallel as you're watching the episode, is you see Daemon try his hardest to just be over the top aggressive about everything, and it fails. And you see Rhaenyra try to be over the top planning and have inaction, and it fails. And it's, once again, it's a reminder that they work best together because Damon is the sword, Rhaenyra is the shield, and it doesn't work without one or the other. I think Rhaenyra knows that she needs someone like Damon around to help support her. However, she also says, what does it say about me to be a ruler if I feel like I need someone to be a ruler? But she's admitting that she's struggling at least. Damon is not admitting that. Damon thinks that he is just fine with how he's doing things and he's just tripping balls every second while he's doing it. But his results are just not there. They're just not. And at some point, he has to figure out that he needs to work with Rhaenyra. He's saying, even to people, you need to call me king. They go, well, you, you know, you're not going to be king. He's like, well, what does the husband of the queen mean? This guy is planning to be on the Iron Throne. He fully believes he should still be the heir and on the Iron Throne. And Rhaenyra is somehow slighting him in a way that's just imaginative and made up. I mean, that's how you end up having sex with your mother in a dream. You have some serious negligence issues. You feel you're entitled to some kind of romance and love from the public, from Rhaenyra, from whatever that you're not getting that you need. And that's what's going on with Damon. And Alice is filling this curiosity and basically giving him these like euphoric mushroom trip experiences that makes him explore these things. But I'm getting tired of the trips, honestly. I, I'm kind of getting there at this point. This is like one thing that I'm getting bothered by in House of the Dragon. I need to see less of him just tripping balls. I really do. I love Damon. I don't like what they're doing with Damon. I, I got one more in me. I got one more in me of them indulging in this pattern over and over again, and I will be officially tired of it. Now, at one point in the episode, Rhaenyra has a conversation with Mysaria, talks about how she's not being respected. And Mysaria says at one point, well, there's more than one way to fight a war, which was very interesting. As a result, they cut to a woman, a handmaiden, that tried to serve dinner earlier in the episode. She was sent off on a boat from Dragonstone, presumably to go to King's Landing. And we see her again at the end of the episode. And who does she go to see at the end of the episode? She visits the girl that was sexually assaulted by Aegon II 
and who was patted on the bottom and worked in a bar. The speculation as to why she was visited, very curious. My first response would be, is because she may have actually ended up having the child of Aegon II, so he has a bastard that people don't know about. Or it could be something as simple as she works at a pub where a lot of royalty goes, or maybe even some Targaryen ancestry is in that pub. I mean, we talked uh, to Ulf White, said that they were part Targaryen, and at the end of the episode, they were talking about people who are part Targaryen, so maybe it's somehow related to that. Either way, the mystery grows, and I love that. But aside from weird Mysaria tricks, one of the things that could really help Rhaenyra and prop her up is the presence of Corlys Velaryon. Now, Bela talks to Corlys Velaryon, which is her grandfather, and says basically all these hype things. We need to keep fighting. I need to make sure that Rhaenyra gets on the Iron Throne. And Corlys, you have been named as Rhaenyra's Hand of the King. And Corlys basically says, I would love to just sail off to Yt and all that stuff and not be a part of this anymore. But Bela basically says, that's that's cowardice. I'm going to make sure that Rhaenyra is going to be on the Iron Throne. And really hypes him up really good. Bela had a great moment in this episode. Absolutely loved it. Jacaris and Bela had two breakout performances in this episode for me. And she had arguably the line of the episode. Corliss was so overwhelmed, so hyped with what cool stuff that Bela had said. He turned around very quickly and says, I would make you my heir, the heir to Driftmark. And Bela, like, smiles, absorbs it, and rejects it pretty much right away and says, no, I am of fire and blood. The heir must be of sea and salt. I was like, yo, that's badass, okay? So the question is, who's that going to be? Now, does it follow what happens in the book? Or do we get something different, kind of like a swerve? I mean, they've definitely teased the idea of Reyna getting something because that was one of her things. There's a moment when she's in the Vale and they talk about how Reyna's not a dragon rider, but she also doesn't really know how to sail or anything. So what does she get? Could this be it? Or could it be one of the bastard children that are like kind of semi-confirmed that we saw in the previous episode that Rainey's acknowledged? It could be any of these people. I'm super curious to see how it goes. Now to shoot all the way back to King's Landing, we first see Igan the second, looks like he's recovering. Allison is by the bedside, staring at him, her baby boy that she never really cared for. And even once in season one said, you're no son of mine. Yes, she said that by the way. However, it looks like she cares in this moment, and it looks like Aegon II is like kind of fine. That for a person that we thought was like dead, he's breathing, he's moving, like not very much, but he's he's moving a little bit. So I think viewers at home, including myself, can presume he's probably gonna live and he's probably gonna be okay, even though the Maester said maybe not. But we skip past that pretty quickly and we see Aemond in the dark throne room, bunch of lightning, because remember, he is now king of Westeros, well, king regent at least. He's definitely got a full-on rager as he's looking at it, but he hears a noise, and behind him is Helena, Queen Helena, and she, in the mystical way that she talks, she says, was it worth it? Was it worth the price you paid? Eamon looked right at her and went, just like that. So I guess Eamon knows that she knows, but I don't know how she could possibly know other than she's just some spooky lady, even though I don't think Eamon believes in that stuff. So there's a lot of turmoil among the Targaryen greens, but Eamon's king, so it kind of is what it is at this point. Aegon II doesn't appear to be dead. Allison's not happy because no one supports her, including Laris and Sir Kristen Cole. And I think Allison is kind of realizing about how much of a monster she's made with Aemond. She's made a totally different one with Aegon. But, like, Aegon's not a bad guy. Aemond appears to be a bad guy. And Allison's kind of realizing that now. Yeah, and that's what years of neglect will do for you. And to wrap up the episode was really exciting. Basically, Jacaris comes back from his trip at the twins, which he tells Rhaenyra, yeah, we pretty much have the twins. They want Harrenhal, and they're going to be on our side. Fantastic. But Rhaenyra really is happy, but she's, she's miserable because this is another sign that she has been incompetent. She's been ineffective as a strong leader up to this point. She said, I, I'm one of the dragon riders. I'm one of the best ones on our team and I can't even go out there. So what am I supposed to do, sit around and watch? She's looking at pictures of Asenia in the books, the dragon queen who was flying with swords in her hand and burning down things on Vagar's back. And her, she's the queen of Dragonstone, not going anywhere. They're ridiculous. So I can understand why she's getting really upset, but they realize that this war is all about the dragons now. Even Jacaris, like he's he's got a dragon, but it's it's young. It's not it's not as good as Syrax. They've got really nothing when it comes to facing Vagar. But Jacaris reminds her, he said, "There's two dragons on Dragonstone that can't compete with Vagar, which is Vermithor and Silverwing. But the problem is they're riderless, and that is that's a pretty big problem." 
They suggest Reyna being one of the people to try to control Vermithor. However, Reyna tried one time and almost died. So what are they to do, right? What are they to do? And Jakara suggests that instead they try to look for people who live on Dragonstone that do have Valyrian blood. Like, it would be very diluted, but... They have Valyrian blood in them somewhere. Maybe it would be a weird Malister that somehow had relations with the Targaryen back in the day. But, as Jacaris would say, like, yeah, it breaks tradition, and it doesn't look very cool to see that the Targaryens can just partial out dragons to random people other than themselves. But, as Jacaris would say, well, it's, it's better than death and defeat. And that was one of those moments where I thought was oddly like one of the coolest moments of the episode. Again, we're seeing Jacaris just like grow up in front of our eyes. It's pretty great. So the episode really ends with them staring at just scrolls and scrolls and scrolls of documents. And I think it's not because they just want to casually read books, but instead I think it's the lineage of all the Targaryens. So you can see the family trees and who exactly may be living on Dragonstone that they can reach out to, to potentially ride one of these dragons that is going to help the Targaryen blacks in the war. I'm very excited to see how that goes because like as a casual viewer, you know only Targaryens really can ride dragons. So as it expands out a little bit to anyone with Valyrian blood, not automatically getting dragons. No, you have to you have to try. Like the dragon has to accept you. Again, Reyna could have gotten a dragon, but she was rejected. So it's not a guarantee. So the process of having someone with only partial Valyrian blood trying to tame a dragon, it's gonna be super fascinating to see. But the Targaryen Blacks do need a bigger dragon that can take on Vagar at this point. The only one that could come close probably is Craxes, and Craxes is nowhere as big. And Damon's tripping balls, so it doesn't even matter. But that's gonna do it for the episode. What did you think? Did you like what happened in this episode? Are you getting tired of the Damon storyline up to this point? I am, that's for sure. Are you excited to see what happens with the dragon seeds? How are you feeling in the after effects of Rhaenys' death? And did you catch that the dog stuck by Cheese's body, even as Cheese was hanging and basically becoming a skeleton outside the walls of King's Landing? I thought that was pretty sick, but the dog deserved better. All right, but that's gonna do it, my friends. Hope you absolutely have an amazing rest of the week. You take care.